My wife's a beginning quilter, and I talked her into making this fancy tool bag for me. Okay, I think we're going to use, let me use this Wagner. Ron Brown's best for peach tree. We're going to come in here, negative ray, this off the side, the center. And when you texture, you want a speed that's somewhere around six, five hundred, six hundred. Got to oil this thing periodically. I'm just gonna poke it in there till it gets to turning. It's got kind of a rounded surface inside, so it's kind of tricky getting this thing where it doesn't rub on the edge. Now, the biggest reason people have a problem with this Wagner tool and don't have good success. It's because they get impatient and they just don't hold it in place long enough because it's not cutting, it's embossing. So you have to press and you have to press real hard and just give it a chance, like one Mississippi, two Mississippi. I mean, you get the idea. You really do have to press a while. And then that gives us a little bit of detail. Now, for those that, we'll, you'll see this in just a moment after I finish and take it out of late. Anytime you do texture, and those of y'all up at Barnesville, you know, this is old, old news to you, but you want to kind of frame it, and you frame it with either a bead or a V-groove, so it'll, it'll kind of bring your focus in. So I'm going to go to get a good look at where that texturing starts and stops. So I'm going to go in here and go in here. Again, negative rate. And I'm using this pyramid tool or v point to a lot of people call it. And this is just a quarter inch high speed steel Anko toolbar. They're Put about the three and a half bucks. They're easy to make. Put it in the tool rest for one second. Yeah. You don't see that. Alright, thank you. So what, what you've got is a three sided scraper. So you get a lot of mileage out of it because you keep you know, keep using different different sides. So it's very versatile, very handy if you're threading, but it's handy for uh, detailing like that. Now that's about as far as we can go with this for the for right now. I could go ahead and start on the bead on the outside before we go to the base. So we'll do that. And I'm gonna switch to a. 3 8 inch detail spindle gouge. Now one thing about beads on a box is it's almost, it's almost impossible to make them too small. We have a tendency, or we want to make them bigger than they need to be. Sometimes they don't need to be more than about a millimeter and a half. We just got to mark. We'll do, we're going to finish this when we put it on a box, because we're going to use the box as a uh, jam chuck. So, oh, somebody's supposed to remind me to finish this. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Well, I guess we'll just slap antique oil on and we'll finish. Actually, we can, we can take time to put it back on there. Well, sometimes I use this UV AAA. This is great stuff. I, how many of y'all have never heard of this stuff before? It's, a, it's got a AAA abrasive compound and a wax kind of base, and it's great for small stuff like little boxes and ornaments. It's not something you normally use on a bowl. And, and it, it's an abrasive, and it cleans up the sanding. And it, you know, if you sand about 400, it's like it'll take you up to a finish close to 800 or 1,000 or 1,200. Uh, but we're going to skip that and just go straight to uh, rubbing a little finish on it. I use different kinds of finishes. I'm still a work in progress, but for tonight I'm going to use the Mahoney's Walnut Finish, Walnut Oil Wax Finish. It's not a real strong finish. It's mostly walnut oil with some uh, beeswax and some carnauba wax in it. But one thing that, that the real social redeeming value that it has is very fast, but it gives it a very nice smell. Uh, I usually use antique oil for almost everything I do. But it takes multiple coats, and for small things, it's a little more troublesome. But for this, it, it just gives a very nice smell. 
But it's going to give it a real shiny finish. Uh, and those of you all sell your work, I understand that uh, shiny sells. So we'll set this aside to finish it. Now let's go to the base. So before I finish hollowing the thing, the first thing I got to do is, is get a pretty close to what that uh, uh, tenon is going to be to fit this thing, or otherwise I'm liable to hollow it and make the inside bigger than the outside. And as we know, turning is a subtractive process, unless you're a segmenter, right? I'm going to measure that and get a feel for it. There it is. We don't have to come down much. I typically use a parting tool for setting the tenon just because it's fast and easy. When I fine tune, sometimes I use a skew, but usually not for rough fitting. Now, the first thing I do is I bevel the edge a little bit. I talked about making a box as a sequential process, and this is the process. First thing we do is the lid. Then we go to the base. And the reason we do that primarily is it's a lot easier to fit the tenon to the recess than it is to fit the recess for it to the tenon. The other thing is if you, if you make a mistake here, you can always make it smaller. You just chase the tenon back a little bit, make it a little, you know, resize it and come on back. You mess this up, start all over. So that's one of the reasons why you have that sequence. Do the lid first, then you do the, do the base. Um, oh, the other thing I want to show you was something I call successive approximation. And also wood. Where do we get wood from? Green wood. What I normally do, say that's the end of a log. You know, you're going to come in here with your chainsaw, and you're going to cut this, and you're going to have this nice big bowl blank here. You're going to cut it an mm -hmm. inch or so away from the pit, depending on how big the log is, maybe a little further. So then you're going to come in on this side with your chainsaw, and maybe you got another bowl blank here, maybe you got a flatter blank here and a smaller bowl blank. This part in the middle, you're going to cut out the pit, and then here, you got these two spindle blanks. And it's all quarter sawn wood, which is perfect because it's not going to move as much. You get a you get a box blank out here, and it's going to be a little more problematic. So this is a perfect way to use this. And then you throw away this this part in the middle. So that's where you get your wood from, and you just get in the habit when you break down your bowl blanks, put that uh, spindle stock up on the shelf, and then you're going to be good to go one of these days when you start making boxes or or something else. The other uh, the, the, the trick, and I don't know if I can draw a picture. This will be the first time I've drawn this picture, so I may not get it right. So we got us a tenon. And it's just the top half of it. First thing we're going to do is we're going to we're going to bevel this a little bit. Then we're going to trial fit to see if it's if it's close. And if it doesn't if it doesn't even begin to slip on here, what that means is we can come down here and get this thing square all the way out to where that corner was. You follow me? And then we do it again, and we put another little little bevel on it and trial fit it, see if it'll start slipping over. If it does, you notice how far it goes, and then that's how you know you need to bring it down. If it still doesn't fit, you get to come all the way down here and do it again. And it's just a real a fairly uh, I won't say how quick it is depends on the individual, but, but it's very safe in, in that it keeps you from uh, on track and from making it usually any real bad mistakes. So we can see it's just beginning to fit over, just barely. So that means I can come back, back here and bring it almost down. And then I bring it back just a little bit more. Now, I'm not trying to really do a fit on this box. I just want to get this thing pretty close before I hollow the inside. This gives me the, the outer dimension, and I've still got a little bit of room to play with. So I've got, I've got this much room to play with that I can continue to hollow out. So we're going to go back to that box scraper.
Now I'm trying to get the inside walls parallel. Now why do I want to bother to do that? So we use a jam chuck. Otherwise, you don't have a good way of holding this box to finish off the very bottom. So you want to get these inside walls fairly square. Now, I didn't show you on the lid, but the technique you use to say, well, did I get it square or not? What works for me is a little, uh, little six-inch ruler, and you just hold it up there and kind of, kind of press it flat and then kind of eyeball it against the bedways and say, is it pointing in or pointing out? Typically, initially, it'll point out just a little bit because as you go in, subconsciously, you never press as hard to back as you do in the front. So it's, I almost always have to come back again and sort of tweak it a little bit. And just don't cut any off the front. Put a little more pressure on the back as I come back, to, back there. And then if I don't measure it now, you don't know whether I got it right or not, huh? And we don't know if it's going to jam chuck until we try to put jam chuck on it. That's pretty close. That's close enough. You don't want a box to be clunky. On the other hand, in a, in a demonstration, it's hard to take the time to get this thing up to the standards that you'd normally like to have for a box. So it's a challenge of knowing when to quit and knowing you know, having enough time that you're not going to run out and cover everything you want to cover. So let's see what happens here. Again, the handle a little bit higher than the cutting edge. And we're just going to do a little more hollowing out. I'm going to turn it up, do a little bit of a shear scrape. Now if you're doing a cylinder box, like like this, this one right here in the back, it's kind of straight like that. That that's about all you need is something like this. I find for a box like this, it's got a shoulder, and you want the walls to take it down a little bit. You almost need to use a scraper like this. This is a I call this a Dale Nish scraper. You can see these in craft supply catalogs. Some people call it a nickel scraper. Uh, or a dime scraper where this round circle is a little bit larger than the size of a nickel or a dime depending on what you're going to use it for. And just gonna... Because it gets thin, you've got to make sure the tool rest is far enough back to give you some support when you run into problems as you always do. At least as I always do when I'm using a scraper. less aggressive when you roll it up on the side, except sometimes when you're bottom, if you're not careful. And if you get too much steel with a scraper on wood, that's when you get into trouble. That's one of the times you get in trouble. So when you're near the bottom and you're swinging in that rounded area, if you get this part cutting at the same time you get this part cutting, that sometimes gives you a, a, what we technically call a catch. That feels pretty smooth. The wall's not too bad. So we're going to go ahead and uh, hit a lick and promise on Sandy. Do you use a round bottom? I do. That, that's a good question. I don't see any purpose for square bottoms. First of all, they're harder to make, and they're harder to sand, and they're harder from a functional user point. If, if a lady, and they're the only one's going to be buying these boxes, generally speaking, they reach in there to pick something out of it, and it goes into the corner, and it's harder to get out. If it's round, it slides on out. So rounding is, is easier all the way around and more functional. So we're going to... Now, you do want to be cautious, especially as the boxes get larger, sticking your finger in there. But if you're careful, don't press too hard, don't get crazy about it. It's usually not a problem. If you've got ridges in there, try to get those out with a scraper. Now the trick that I, that I use, is I've made these little sanding uh, demon flitches, put a little uh, 
cotton batting or something on the tip, wrap it over with a thin piece, and then come 90 degrees the other direction and wrap it over again and, it, and just, you know, tighten it up with, with, with some tape, duct tape or something. And this makes it really easy. Do it with 100 grit, 120 grit. Stop and feel for any rough spots. See is there any area you really need working on. And maybe 220. Maybe for the inside, you didn't have any bad tool marks with a scraper, but it may be good enough, especially when you put that UV triple E on it. It'll just make it smooth, smooth, smooth. Look all that done. Now before we try to fit the lid, I'm going to go ahead and shape, start shaping the outside of this so I'll have room to get in on that, uh, on that bead right there. So I'm going to say that probably the thickest part of the box is probably going to be somewhere maybe right about there. We're not going to touch that. This is where your beads and coves practice comes in. If you haven't practiced doing a lot of beads and coves, you know, go back and practice your beads and coves before you make a box. Because you want to have some basic tool skills before you do this. Actually, I don't like that. That gouge as much as I do the regular, regular 3 8 inch spindle gouge. It's got wide. The difference between these two, you know, these are both detail gouges, they're both spindle gouges, uh, they're, rather, they're both spindle gouges, they're both 3 8 inch and they're both made by uh, uh, Thompson. This one is a regular spindle gouge and it has a fairly, uh, fairly shallow cove in it, which gives you a fingernail round edge to it, the profile. The detail gouge, he doesn't take but just a little bit of milling on this thing. The flute is not nearly as deep. So there's a, just a whole lot more steel on this thing, which makes what it allows you to do is it allows you to put a point on it. It'd be very difficult to really put a point on this and, having a, and have a cutting, uh, having wings on it. It's just the nature of the flute design. Whereas this one, you can bring those wings back and have a very point. And it makes it easy to do, de to do detail work on beading, uh, in narrow, confined areas, and it's also a handy tool when you're doing the uh, cleaning up a tenon for a bowl blank, because because there's so much steel, and you're not going to get a lot of chatter. You can hang over a tool rest a little bit, fairly uh, fairly comfortably, because it's a pretty solid tool. The downside of it is because it's pointed, you start making a, a big bead out of it. You're going to have a tendency because that point maybe get some ripples that you're less likely to get with with a, a broader fingernail gouge. back to fitting. Now the one thing we want to make sure is the tenon matches the recess or it's at least doesn't exceed the recess. Just barely. This is the challenging part. This is where I'm going to reach for my skew for us to do the, the final cleanup. Now I try to, to, to put on here what what they call a bellied a bellied tenon. You know, there's different kind of lid types, and I've got examples of just about all of them uh, out here. What I'm striving for is is this right here. It's belly. In other words, it's got a little bit of a chamfer on the front end and just a little bit of a chamfer on the back end. So it slides on 
and then it kind of kind of snaps on. Uh, sometimes I I strive for a loose fit. Actually, I'll tell you at the end of this demonstration whether whether I was striving for a really tight fit or a loose fit. <laughs> The turners like the snap fits, but I understand customers would rather have it looser. And when I watch my mother-in-law open a box and if she's struggling with it, I know it's too tight. And, and they really want them looser than we, we tend to think they do. Now Richard Raffin advocates sticking this thing on there while it's turning and look for a burnishing mark. I have not had good results with that. Number one, it can leave you burn marks. And if you don't, have, if you have any rough edges on this and it snatches it out of your hand, let me tell you, bad things happen. Bad words are said. Generally, you don't want to resort to sandpaper on getting this fit. I'm kind of watching that shadow edge up there to see how that shape is changing. Again, I'm not trying to get the perfect fit now. I just want, I want a really tight fit where I can put this on there and use this as a jam chuck to finish the base. Okay, that looks good. I'm a big believer in this... Uh, Nova Life Center. I really like it. It's got a lot of little parts to play with. Very versatile. And very high quality. It's got three bearings in it. Same as a Pyromatic or a, or a one-way. But you don't have to do any threading to put an auxiliary piece on it. It's got a hanging... It, it uses a short stubby Morse taper and it actually comes with a bolt that you can thread in an attachment and you have to smooth off the, the numbers and letters to get that smooth surface. So you got a very flat surface or you can use a hanger bolt where this thing threads in here and then you get these screw threads. All you got to do is drill a hole that will fit that thing, put on whatever chunk of wood you want for as big a bull nose as you got and thread it on there. And to true it up, because it's on a little short stubby Morse taper, you can put it in here without putting that pin and taping down a, something twisted in a in your pyromatic and then try to tap threads. I've done it both ways, and let me tell you, this way I find a lot easier. Nice system, very reasonably priced for the quality. Okay, so there's the bottom. So. The bottom of the box is going to be actually it's coming out from this way. The, 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 the inside of the of the lid. But this is really going to be the bottom of the box right here. So this is going to go away. This is the, the top on the lid. Sometimes it's easy to get impatient on, on this step because you're just wasting wood, but you do want to kind of take your time. I don't like to use a parting tool for this step because you're putting so much lateral pressure on there that. Uh, if you don't use tailstock support, sometimes it knocks it loose. So slicing these fibers tends to work better for me. Alright, now here's where we start coming in with our design of the top. I 
trying to make a subtle OG here. shape right here as we come down toward that bead. Again, I like to have a continuous curve. Straight sides are kind of boring. Curves are good. I rotate this on the sides so I don't get a wing into it. So I've got a little quarter inch detail gouge for this sort of thing. delicate cuts because there's not a lot holding this on that jam chuck. some triple E on here just so y'all can see what it looks like. This is really great stuff. Kind of a, it's kind of a wax looking stuff. Just kind of rub it on a little bit. Like I say, it's got abrasive in there. This is great if you're doing a friction finish on top. It probably wouldn't be a bad idea to use some cellulose uh, sanding sealer first. Seal the wood. And then higher speed is better. You want to get this thing up. Maybe 1800 or so. Kind of pin turning speed, maybe. But it just gives it a very, very smooth tactile feel. Very similar to if you put it on the Beale buffing system, except it's just faster and easier if you're doing this all on, on the uh, box, uh, on the lathe at one time. So get that feed. Not pressing real hard or it'll go flying across the room. Okay. 
that. But it's wood. It grows on trees. Okay.